name is Karen Armstrong Cummings and as chair of Together Frankfurt, I want to welcome everyone here this evening. We certainly appreciate everyone who could turn out. This was initially planned to be a Secretary of State's candidate forum and it just didn't work out that way. We invited both candidate uh, Adams and candidate Heather French Henry and um, uh, candidate Henry declined. And we are so appreciative of uh, candidate Adams from coming in from Louisville and driving over to be with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, bef before we finished out the program, we decided since we didn't have two candidates from the Secretary of State's office, what we really wanted to do was focus on voting and election security because it's a critical issue right now. And so we spoke with our friends with the League of Women Voters, and we are so appreciative that they're with us here tonight to talk about one of the most critical election issues, which is redistricting. And we had also spoken to our local clerk, Jeff Hancock, who's going to talk about how you can get involved right here in Frankfurt. Um, I, was, I had heard a presentation by Sherry Donahue, and I heard her speak about cybersecurity and her background in cybersecurity, and I, and I asked her to speak. We didn't uh, intentionally neglect Auditor uh, Michael um, Harmon. I used to work for Mike Harmon, and he's a wonderful human being. Uh, but next month, I mean, not next month, in October, October 15th, Right here in this room, we're, going to, we're inviting all statewide candidates for public office, and we're going to have a meet and greet and have an opportunity to meet with all of those folks. So come back for that if you, if you can, mark it on your calendar. I want to emphasize that Together Frankfurt does not oppose or endorse political parties or candidates, uh, but we work to educate, and that's the purpose of this meeting this evening which is to educate. So we encourage you to ask questions, and each of you should have a card that's got um, a three by, three by five card to write your questions on. And our Together Frankfurt coordinators, if you would hold your hand up, they're gonna be walking around the room to collect cards, and they will be given to uh, Josh Douglas, our interviewer, to, um, to, to make questions. So, I want you to, this is not like a campaign rally, so please hold your applause until the end of each candidate's closing statement, uh, and then give them a big round of applause, please. Um, I, want to, I want to say that um, we've had some questions about photos. We would, we would really prefer you not making photos during the presentations, just because of this room, it's, it's very easy to block somebody else's view. Uh, we do have a couple of reporters in the room, and we certainly appreciate their being here, and we certainly appreciate Cable 10 being here and recording this. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our own local Cable 10. Um, but if you could, refrain from photos until um, the reception starts, and then get your picture made with, uh, with, with all these fine folks who are here. I want to thank especially a couple of organizations that have helped promote this event. These are the uh, Frankfurt Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta and the Frankfurt Franklin County Chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Would you stand, please, if you're from that organization? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. These fine folks have officially partnered with us and uh, are working hard on getting people to turn out to vote. At this point in time, I have the um, privilege of introducing my uh, moderator for this evening, our moderator, Bill Clear. He's a recent Frankfurt resident, came here from Woodford County. I also will introduce our interviewer. Some of you all met him last time, Joshua A. Douglas, University of Kentucky Law professor with his wonderful book, Vote for Us. If you haven't read it, buy it, get a copy. You can learn all kinds of things. Um, and it's available down at Poor Richard's Bookstore, if I'll put in a plug for them, too. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. And I'll turn it over to our wonderful friend, Bill. 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Karen does so much for us in Together Frankfurt, and she just does a wonderful job as well as all the, the coordinators. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight again. And again, this is Together Frankfurt. We're trying to uh, provide an educational forum for you all to learn something about not only the candidates, but our election processes and the things that are going on. Um, the format tonight is uh, the candidates will have an opening statement, then uh, Josh will ask some questions that have been prepared in advance, and they will be answered. After that, there will be an opportunity for you all to submit questions. You'll answer those, and then they'll have a, a, a closing statement for each of our speakers. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, candidate Michael G. Adams. Michael Adams is the Republican candidate for the Office of Secretary of State. Uh, he is a University of Louisville and Harvard Law School graduate. In his recent activity for the le past 11 years, he's been the general counsel for the Republican Governors Associ Association nationally. He's a Paducah native and a Kentuckian, and, and uh, welcome. Welcome, Michael Thank Adams. Do I need the mic? Is it better with or without? Yes, with? Better, better with the mic. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, good evening. I want to thank all of you for being here. I especially want to thank those of you who organized this event and, and uh, Professor Douglas, uh, all of you putting your skin in the game to make this happen. I don't have to tell you how much is broken with our political culture today. Uh, how much is broken in our civic culture. And I think our political culture is downstream from our civic culture, but they're both highly flawed and problematic. We can't begin to address all the problems today with those cultures, but there are two big ones that we see certainly in the election field. One is disengagement and one is distrust. And you all help solve, or at least in, in one small way on one evening, help address both of those problems, and, and here's why. Number one, disengagement. Far too few good people run for office. Far too few good people register to vote. Far too few good people actually do vote once they register. And far too few of them, when they actually do show up to vote, know enough about the candidates and the issues uh, because they're not educated, they're not given enough information. So that's why you all are so important to this process. It's why candidates are important. We have to actually show up and, and appear to be part of that process. Uh, but if it weren't for your organization, what you do, what your sister organizations do, we'd really be at a loss. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you for doing that. Uh, the other issue is, is distrust. One of uh, the little known duties of the Secretary of State, uh, certainly chief election officials, the biggest one, uh, but we've got all sorts of administrative duties and, and one of them is to be the custodian of the state seal. And you're familiar, I think, with the state seal. It's my favorite of, of all 50 of them. It's two gentlemen shaking hands, one is in buckskin and one's in formal dress. And what I love about that is you've got a, you've got a, a snapshot of one person who's probably highly educated, one person who probably is not, uh, probably people of different socioeconomic classes, maybe backgrounds too, uh, two people whose interests are probably different, maybe contradictory interests, and they're shaking hands and they're reaching across the divide because they want to find common ground. And that's what a commonwealth is. That's why we have this form of government. It's based on that premise that we can actually work together and find common ground. I'll be very blunt. Part of the reason I wanted to do this event so bad and confirm for, for both of the dates that you offered is uh, I went to your website and a lot of the issues where you have positions, I disagree with those positions. That actually made me more likely to want to be here tonight because I think part of what candidates don't do a good enough job of they, they focus on their base, they focus on people they know are already with them to get the maximum turnout. And that's part of it, I get that, but they don't do enough to reach out to the center, they don't do enough to reach out to the other side. And it's a two-way two street. They need to listen more, and they also need to be heard more. And I think it's a big mistake for candidates to write off 60% of the population and focus on getting their 40% out to vote. So that's part of why I'm here. I don't know if I'll persuade anybody, but that's okay. I'm also here to listen and get some perspective. Uh, I wasn't allowed to use props tonight, uh, but if I were, I would hold up a copy of Professor Douglas's book. It's really good. 
Uh, if, you, if you've not read it, uh, you can do so in about a day. It's a really quick, easy read. Uh, it's really thoughtful. And there's a lot in there that I agree with and some I disagree with, but the important thing is to have the conversation. So thank you all for being a part of that tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You are Michael, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for those comments and for the kind plug of my book. Um, uh, those of you, most of you know me, um, uh, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Josh Douglas. I teach at the University of Kentucky College of Law. We have a brand new building that was just opened uh, today, in fact, is the first day of classes. So I just finished teaching at 5 o'clock and came over here, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you because, as Michael said, I think it's so important for civic engagement, and that's a lot of what I work on and what my book is about, and so I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm also, I'll admit right now, an undecided voter in uh, this race as well as actually all of the races. And so uh, my vote, as I think many people here, is up for grabs and I definitely will be voting. Uh, and so I'm interested to hear what all the candidates have to say. Um, I feel like a little bit of a, a presidential debate moderator when I make this statement, which is that uh, no one has seen the questions I'm going to ask but me. Uh, I spent time, I asked some people in the law school and some others what I should ask, but uh, I myself wrote all these questions, and, uh, and so uh, here we go. Um, we have about 10 minutes for my, qu my questions, although I don't think you took your full five minutes, and I, you, you told me uh, off stage that you probably won't take your full eight for closing, so uh, we have a little bit of time, and if the audience has questions, please put them on note cards, and I will uh, read through them uh, as well. All right, first question is, turnout in Kentucky is typically well below the national average. In 2015, we had turnout of 31%. Uh, that's the last gubernatorial and statewide election for Secretary of State. 2016 presidential, it was 59.1%. In 2018, turnout in Kentucky was 49%. So in the past three election cycles, the only one with a turnout of even half the eligible electorate was the presidential election, and again, 31% turnout in the last statewide election. What specific things will you do if elected Secretary of State to improve turnout? Can I ask a quick question? Please. Is there a limit on the answer time or is it just a limit if on you the could, question If time? you could take about a minute per, uh, since I have a lot of topics I'd like to go through, yeah. if you wouldn't mind taking about a minute uh, or no more than a minute, but if obviously you need to flesh things out, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. So uh, obviously that's embarrassing. Uh, we're well behind most of the country. Uh, it's not a new circumstance. If you go back 50 or 60 years, uh, it's been the case for a long time that our turnout lags that of other states. Uh, academics have written studies about not just us, but looking at voter turnout across the states, and they have different theories for why it is. Uh, one of the theories that I found persuasive when I was a college student was states are settled by different groups of people from different heritages, and in some heritages from certain parts of Europe, voting is is more commonly done than in other countries. And so I, I don't have a, an easy answer for why it is that way, but in terms of how we fix it, I have a few ideas. Uh, number one, there are little programmatic things that we can do better. Uh, one thing that I've advocated for is actually making it a bit easier to vote by mail. Uh, the legislature changed the law a couple of years ago, and I agree with, I'll be frank, a lot of what the Republicans have done in Frankfurt, but I disagree with this. They changed the law where if you're, it used to be if you voted absentee and you weren't going to be in your county on election day you could vote by mail and I'll confess I have some self-interest in this because I usually vote by mail because I'm usually traveling on election day I'm an attorney I've got clients all over the country with their own campaigns uh, so that's how you used to be able to do it two years ago the law changed and it said what well, used to be that you if you were going to be in town on election day you can vote by mail now it says if you won't be in town on election day or any of the other days offered for early voting at the clerk's office, then you can't vote by mail. And that's very frustrating to anybody who's uh, typically voted by mail without regard to what they do for a living. If, if they're busy, they can't vote all of a sudden unless they find a way to go wait in line. So I did that, and I had to wait hours <laughs> to vote on a machine in Jefferson County. Uh, I saw people turn around and walk out. That was very frustrating. I had the luxury of time. I'm self-employed, so I kind of set my own schedule. Most people don't. Most people are employees. So one thing I'd like to do is change that back. Uh, another thing I'd like to do is, this is purely accidental. It's not by ill intent, but it's still a problem. Right now, state law actually makes it difficult for a county clerk to offer early voting machines in more than one location. It's because of the word the instead of the word a in the statute. 
I sat down with the clerk's office in Jefferson County where I live and they walked me through some ideas they had for improving the system and one of them was let us have early voting machines in more than one location. When I voted early in, in Louisville, uh, there was a, literally a long line down the stairs and out the door <laughs> because the only place Jefferson County could put their machines was in the central office of the clerk which is in uh, old Louisville, downtown Louisville but they have multiple branch offices all over the county, but they cannot put the machines in those branch offices for early voting. It's absurd, and it's not by design. It's just really by accident. So following up on that theme, let me ask you about three specific proposals uh, that other states have adopted and seen higher turnout after them. Automatic voter registration, where the state takes the responsibility of registering voters uh, who can then opt out once they've been automatically registered using information from the DMV office. Same day registration, where a voter can show up on election day and register and vote uh, at the polls. It happens in places like Wisconsin and Minnesota uh, that has very high turnout. And universal vote by mail, or also known as vote at home, where every voter is automatically mailed a ballot a, a few weeks before election day that they can fill, research, fill out at home, uh, and then drop either in a secure drop box or return via the mail. So three proposals, I'd like to know whether you support each one of those and, and why, yes or no. Well, I'm against all three of those and I'll delineate why. I'm particularly concerned about tying the first one to the third one. I think those two together are actually more problematic as the sum of their parts, uh, but I'll go through all of them. Uh, so the first idea is that we should register people without their prior consent. Uh, the Libertarian part of me doesn't like the idea of the government taking an action as to an individual without the individual's prior consent. That's really a, a philosophical objection. Uh, when you tie that into having vote by mail, what that results in is you have basically government databases, which are, of course, famously always correct, right? You have these government databases being dumped into the voter file, and then you have people being mailed ballots automatically. That, to me, is, is dually and doubly problematic because you've got concerned about these databases being accurate and then you don't have a way to check voters when they're actually coming to vote because the ballots are all being mailed out. In, in terms of same-day registration, uh, the entire premise of having voter registration is that so we've got some lead time in the government to make sure everything's above board, to make sure you haven't voted somewhere else already. Uh, obviously a lot of states have early voting already by law. Uh, it's possible to vote in Ohio or uh, some other state and then come in here and vote if you're able to register the same day. So to me, it's uh, obviously I'm in favor of any person who legally is able to vote being able to vote. I don't believe in suppression, and I believe sincerely that anybody who's qualified, I want that person to vote. Uh, and I do think there are things that we can do on the margins to make that easier and simpler. The best idea, and I'm actually surprised I hadn't heard of this before, in, in Professor Douglas's book about midway through, he talks about vote centers that were instituted in Colorado. Uh, you may not know this, but about 0.1% of votes cast in Kentucky are cast by provisional ballots. That's, that's people who didn't have any way to verify their identity and then they cast votes and then those votes can be later counted after the voter shows up with some sort of identification. Uh, but the number one reason those votes are cast incorrectly and those voters don't get the vote and have their vote count immediately is because people don't know what precinct they live in. Well, why don't you change the system where instead of voting in your tie to a precinct, right now, if you ship the wrong precinct, you don't get to vote, period. They send you away. I've worked the polls lots of times, either as a volunteer attorney uh, or as a member of the State Board of Elections. And the number one call we get all day every day is people being turned away from the voting site because they got their precinct wrong. If we can correct for this, and we probably have to do it with a pilot program, like I think other states have done it, if we can come up with a way to have a pilot program, maybe try this in Jefferson and Fayette County, where people aren't tied to their precinct. If you're in a small town, you probably always vote at the high school or the temple or wherever it is. But if you live in a busy urban environment, why not tie that to your county of residence, but not some arbitrary precinct? Okay, so no on automatic voter registration, same day registration, universal vote by mail, yes on vote centers. Yeah, but let me, sorry, I, I was very quick on answering those, just real fast. On vote by mail, my biggest concern is Kentucky has a unique history of, of election corruption in the form of vote buying. And it's been done in two ways. The way it's usually, and this is not an ancient history, this is a recent history. Uh, it won't hurt my feelings if you Google this on your phones while I talk, but Google R.G. Dunlop election fraud, and you'll pull up a Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting story from a few years ago. Uh, and this is certainly not a right-wing uh, organization. They wrote a story about vote buying in Kentucky. And we've got a history of this that, say, in Oregon, where they have universal vote by mail, 
they don't, they don't have this history, but we do. We're a poor state, and you have a cluster of counties in very impoverished eastern Kentucky where you've got histories of even decades of, of vote buying. This is done primarily by absentee ballots because those are the only ballots you can take outside the voting site and vote. The only time people have been able, at least have been caught, cheating at the election site and prosecuted successfully is when you had uh, electronic machines and the poll workers tricked the voters into thinking that you didn't have to push the vote button to count the ballot. They had the people fill out the votes and then walk out and then they went and they changed all the votes and then hit the vote button. But in every other instance, in Floyd County and McGoffin County, what they did is they voted fraudulently by absentee voting. Right now, now again, I said I was in favor of expanded voting by mail, but right now about 2% of Kentucky voters vote absentee. I think it's very unlikely that you're going to have massive election corruption as a general matter when you've got a very small proportion of the ballots done by mail. And so you only have a few problem spots that have that now. But if you had this unlimited and every person in Kentucky is voting by mail, my concern is you're going to have much more rampant vote fraud. And in the states that have universal vote by mail, are you aware of massive election fraud in the way that you're suggesting? I, I'm not, uh, but I'm, I've not been a member of their boards of elections, so I, I wouldn't have that information. Um, let's move to felon disenfranchisement, or felon reenfranchisement. In response to a questionnaire by Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, uh, about the question of felon disenfranchisement, you said, uh, in my capacity as a voter, I would not support a constitutional amendment that automatically restores voting rights to any person convicted of felony election fraud. My question is, what about non-election fraud former felons? Do you support the restoration of voting rights to those convicted of felonies who have completed their sentences, accepting those convicted of election fraud? Well, I do in part, and this is a bit of, of a nuanced response, so uh, let me unpack it for a minute. So what we're talking about, obviously, in context is right now our Constitution automatically disenfranchises a person who's been convicted of a felony. Uh, there's a process that's allowed for in the Constitution that if a, if a disenfranchised uh, former voter, uh, or I should say a, a felon who wants to be a voter, wants to vote, the process is they have to essentially apply to the governor for an executive order that reinstates those rights. And I've actually done pro bono work for someone who was impacted by this to try to help this person uh, get their rights back. Uh, it's a real thing, and I know this from my own personal experience because I have someone I'm close to who went through this. And she's a, a sweet lady who got mixed up with the wrong crowd when she was in her early 20s, had a boyfriend who was dealing drugs and hid some stuff for him and got caught, and it, it ruined most of her life. She went to prison, she got out, and she wasn't in prison very long, but the time after she was out, it, it wasn't just voting, it was all sorts of things in life that were off, off limits to her. Uh, she now works in a bank in a position that requires confidence by her employer, but to ever get there, she had to work in a McDonald's serving Happy Meals for a long time to, to get an employment history back where she could even be in a position to meet anyone who would hire her for a better job. So, sorry, that's a long-winded answer. So here's where I stand on this. There are different types of crimes, and there are different versions of this legislation. Uh, every version that I've seen has an exemption for felons who committed a violent offense, a, a rape or a murder, a burglary, things like that. Uh, there's consensus that would I have those exceptions. Uh, there are different versions of the law depending on certain other categories included. Uh, so my objection to the version that I was commenting on when I saw that uh, survey was a more limited version that had a specific exception for election law bribery, but not other election law felonies. And there are dozens and dozens of election law felonies that are not bribery. If you tamper with a voting machine, that's not bribery, but it's still an election law felony. Uh, I don't know Mrs. Henry's position on it. What I understand to be her position, I think is actually pretty close to mine, that we ought to have an exception for every election law felony and for every violent felony. I give, so can I, can yeah, I just please. try to get you on the record yeah. more precisely then? Uh, so is it accurate to say that you would support a bill that would restore the right to vote to those felons, former felons, who have completed their sentences with the exception of all election fraud crimes and all violent felonies? Two, two minor nuances. So one thing is I think we should also, for crimes that are victimless, I, I especially want to have the so-called victimless crimes in here. If you have a, a drug offense where no one was injured, if, if you were a if you were possessed marijuana or something like this, this is actually where a lot of these convictions come from. People have some dope in their, in their dorm room and then suddenly they can't vote anymore. I, have, I, pers I support an unlimited exception for those people to be able to get their rights back without some sort of executive order from the governor. I think that actually will solve a lot of our problem about a, a dual system of justice 
where African Americans were especially disenfranchised. And will you commit as Secretary of State to work on a bill that would do that? I would. But I want to add one more quick point. I, I know you're, uh, you've been very patient. I, there are crimes of, of monetary nature where funds are, are misappropriated. I do think it's appropriate to require, uh, you know, the, the terminology we all use is paid your debts to society. I think we ought to also have a requirement that those people repay debts if they've stolen money from individuals. Uh, so that's a very limited exception. What about court fines and fees? Would you require the payment back of court fines and fees before no. returning? Okay. Um, how are we doing on time for my, my, my portion here? Okay, let me keep going. On May 5th, 2019, you wrote in the, uh, an op-ed for the Louisville Courier Journal, uh, and you wrote, quote, my highest priority is requiring a photo ID to vote, as in other states. But you didn't explain in that piece why that would be your highest priority or why a photo ID law would improve Kentucky elections. Can you please explain why you support a photo ID law, what fraud exists in Kentucky elections that a photo ID law would prevent, uh, and why the photo ID law would help? Sure. Well, first of all, there are different types of photo ID. Uh, there are very strict requirements. There are very loose requirements. There's a, several states like ours right now that has no photo ID but requires other ID. I'm, I'm in the middle of the spectrum on this. I favor Indiana's law. Indiana's law, I think, is fairly generous and has worked pretty well in practice the last dozen years. There are all sorts of exceptions uh, for people. And ultimately, anyone who still can't provide an ID, even though they are free, ultimately is going to be able to, to vote if they sign an affidavit after the fact. Uh, so I, th I support an ID law. I don't support a very draconian ID law like Texas has or uh, Wisconsin or North Carolina. I want to make this as easy as possible and as simple and, 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 frankly, free as possible. Uh, I also want a law that will sustain Supreme Court review. I don't want to spend the next eight years tied up in litigation over this. I want a law that already meets what the Supreme Court said. So let me get to that. So uh, Indiana passed a law back in 2005. Uh, it was challenged. It went to the Supreme Court. And Justice John Paul Stevens, probably the most liberal member of the court uh, at the time, wrote the opinion sustaining the law. And he looked at, obviously, all of the arguments of both sides, and he concluded that there's no uh, concerted scheme of fraud to tip elections as a general matter, and I, I agree with that. But there are, in, are discrete instances where you could have election fraud that could tip the outcome of an election in a close election. In 2018, we had four state house races that were decided by seven votes or fewer. There were other close elections, too, uh, but you had the supermajority of the House which party would control whether the Republicans would have a supermajority or not was dictated by literally a handful of votes in four districts. Uh, one of those elections was decided by one vote. <laughs> it was one vote on election night, went to the House, and they said it was a tie. Uh, so do I think there's a widespread conspiracy to steal elections? No. But do I think that in a very close race, you could have voter fraud tip the outcome? Absolutely. This is just... Can I, uh, can yeah. I just press you for a moment on that? What kind of voter fraud are we talking about that you're concerned about that a photo ID law would prevent? Impersonation. And is there any evidence that there's been impersonation voter fraud in Kentucky elections? Yeah, if you go back and read these cases, it's a part of the process. It's not the usual way that this is done, but it's part of, especially in other states, uh, more so than here, I'll confess, but in, New, in uh, Brooklyn, New York, in the mid-80s, uh, there was a famous case, and they found thousands of impersonation instances. Uh, so what the court said, John Paul Stevens said, is, well, look, I don't necessarily have to conclude that this law solves all of these problems, but it's one component. And I've been open from the beginning. This is just one component of the things I want to fix. I also want to maintain our voter rolls. Uh, frankly, I think there's probably more elections impacted by human error, innocent human error, than by vote fraud. So why then would you make, you wrote in that Courier Journal, this would be your highest priority. I'm curious as to why y this issue of voter I a photo ID is your highest priority as, as uh, Secretary of State. To me, this is the most obvious loophole in our law that gives people a lack of confidence that our elections are secure. And uh, if, you're a, if you're a fan of campaign finance reform, uh, I'm, a I'm a fan of some of it, not all of it. Uh, but if you're a fan of contribution limits on candidates, the reason the Supreme Court has upheld that is not because they really think that you can buy Bernie Sanders for $3,000, which is above the contribution limit. No one really thinks that. No one thinks that you can buy the president, whoever the president is, for $3,000. It's because of the appearance of corruption. 
that's been a legitimate enough motive for the Supreme Court to uphold contribution limits. I think the same thing applies here. This is an appearance of, uh, it's an appearance in, of a massive loophole that allows people to cheat. And I'm not in favor of only doing this. I have other things I want to do too. But to me, this is just, according to the Supreme Court, Justice Stevens, who in turn was citing Jimmy Carter's commission that President Carter served on after the 2000 election. Uh, one of the great points you made in your book is that times change and laws change and society changes and the election laws need to keep up with it. Well, that's what the Carter Commission found and that's what Justice Stevens agreed with is that it used to be in America people knew their neighbors and the size of the average precinct has really grown. They don't know their neighbors anymore, even in small towns uh, often. So this is a common sense fix. There are so many occasions on a daily basis where we have to have an ID. Uh, I'll tell you, in Indiana, I was there yesterday on other business, and what I found was that once they passed their photo ID law, they didn't say, okay, well, you're on your own. And actually, that's what the court thought when they sustained the law. But Indiana went out of their way to say, all right, we're actually going to pay to send out vans to senior centers and other places where people don't have the IDs they need, and we're going to go out of our way proactively to find people who don't have IDs and make sure they have them. That's a good thing, even if we don't have a photo, a photo ID law, is to make sure people have IDs just to function in society. Great. Can you remind me what time are the until his closing statements? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to integrate my questions with the uh, audience questions. I just want to remember what time we're going until 6.40. Okay, good. Um, 6.40 until Ms. Donahue. Okay. Good. So we've got about eight minutes. Uh, I'm going to have just a couple other questions for you then. Um, uh, on the photo, uh, photo ID, let me just press one more time because it's a part of an audience question. Without reading the whole thing, uh, this, this person in the audience basically says, evidence of photo ID laws deprive many voters of the right to vote and have a disproportionate effect, and uh, there's little to no evidence of this kind of cheating. So how do you square your support for a photo ID law with the lack of evidence of in-person impersonation? Well, I just cited evidence. Uh, there was a famous case in Brooklyn in the mid-80s of thousands of cases of impersonations. Uh, so so I, I question the premise that it doesn't happen. Again, it's one component of a larger program. Uh, sorry, what was the first part of your question? Oh, so uh, there are different ID laws, and some of them Look, I can't judge the hearts of every legislator in every other state that I haven't met. I think there are probably some people who are political in what they're trying to do. There may be some who are racist in what they're trying to do. I'm not in favor of the laws that they are passing. I'm in favor of Indiana's law, which has been around for a long time. Uh, it's worked pretty well. Uh, it's been sustained by the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a very reasonable law that goes out of its way to make a free ID available to anybody. And if they still can't get there, they still let them vote after the fact with an affidavit. Um, if you could just give a quick yes or no, maybe a sentence response, would you support independent an independent reiterating commission for the state? Uh, a lot of states do have really absurd gerrymandering. We really haven't had that here. The House that elected 63 Republicans a few years ago, those lines were drawn by Democrats. I don't think we have a need for it in Kentucky at the moment. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions, and then we'll get to your closing. Um, uh, what, would you, what specific things would you do to improve civics education regarding our democracy? That's one thing you mentioned at the beginning. And I'll add to that an audience question, which is, you said good people, far too few people, good people do this. What do you mean by good people? <laughs> I, I didn't mean anything in particular by that. Uh, people, of, people of merit, people of goodwill. Uh, that's, that's all I really meant. And what specifically would you do for civics education? Well, so I've, I've actually worked with uh, the Kentucky Center for uh, the study of uh, for the, uh, excuse me, let me restart that. The Kentucky Center for Social Studies, which is a, an independent organization, a social welfare organization that advocates for improving social studies education. The reason I'm sitting here today, the reason I'm a candidate, the reason I've been an election lawyer in my career is because I had a seventh grade teacher who made us bring in clippings from the newspaper every day and take positions pro or con of some op-ed. Uh, I do the same thing to my daughter now. I make her uh, read an op-ed every day and comment on it. Uh, there are little things that we can do and big things. I'll tell you, just anecdotally, the number one reason people tell me that they didn't vote, uh, and I understand this is not data, this is purely anecdotal, it's because I didn't know enough about the candidates. People have information, good or bad, about people running for president, maybe governor. They have no idea who the secretary of state candidates are. They have no idea who the school board candidates are. Part of what I want to do is, uh, when I filed a run for secretary of state, they sent me a letter and they said, give us two or three answers to these questions, give us your website link, and we'll put it on a 
uh, Secretary of State website, paid for by the taxpayers. It's like this much information. I want to expand that and make that available to every candidate for every office in Kentucky. It's free web space. Just let them on there. I'll be done in five seconds. Let them on there. Let them say what they're for. They can't afford a website. They're running for school board in some small town. This is a free resource. I think we need to engage citizenry. Part of participation is knowing what you need to know to show up and, and vote confidently. I promise I'm going to give him a couple minutes for closing and end at 6:40. Oh, okay. uh, so, that's, so don't that's worry. We, what I, that's what we, I'm up here for. Yeah, we, okay. we we talked beforehand. He said he didn't want his full eight minutes. So, okay. uh, so so we're good to go. And I promise I, I'm watching the clock. So yeah. we're good to go. Uh, Thirty second answer, if you don't mind, for the next uh, two questions. Um, one, you've billed yourself as having a national Republican election law practice and touted your ties to Republican Mike Pence's super PAC. What can you say to Democrats in the room to earn their vote? Thirty seconds, please. Uh, well, I, I certainly don't uh, apologize for being an attorney for national Republican causes and, and conservative causes. Uh, I think that actually puts me in a better position to advocate for federal funding, to advocate to give Kentucky a voice in decisions that are made at the highest levels of power. I think that's a good thing. Uh, but when I take my oath and swear myself in or I'm sworn in, uh, my boss is the people of Kentucky. I'm not going to work for the Republicans. One big difference between me and the incumbent, Allison Grimes, uh, there are a lot of differences, uh, but one of them is she uses her position to troll the president, to troll the majority leader. I'm not going to troll Democrats. I'm not going to work against Democrats. I'm probably going to disappoint some Republicans because I'm just going to play it straight and, and do the job and follow the law. I did the same thing on the Board of Elections. Great. Your opponent, uh, as you mentioned, Democratic nominee Heather French Henry, is not here tonight. If she were, what would you say to her and what would you ask her? I only have 30 seconds for that. Only 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'd say, why won't you show up at a public debate ever? Uh, it's very disappointing. Uh, there are f four that I know of, four occasions where Mrs. Henry's been offered the chance to speak at a public forum. She's declined all four. Those are the four that I know about. Obviously, this was one of them. Uh, I think it's disappointing, and it's part of the celebrity culture we have that people just hide behind 30-second ads and high name ID, and uh, they don't engage the voters. That's a big problem with our democracy. Great. Lightning round, one word answers, and then you'll have time for closing statements. Popeyes or Chick-fil-A? <laughs> Popeyes. Ice cream or cookies for dessert? Ice cream. Seinfeld or Friends? Definitely Seinfeld. Good answer. <laughs> Better president, George Washington or Abraham Lincoln? Lincoln. Kentucky or Louisville basketball? Uh, how can I find a one word answer that's... Uh, <laughs> I'm a Louisville fan, I'll admit it. All right. This is off the record, right? Uh, you've got three minutes for closing, and thank you for answering and being candid for my questions. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm used to billing by the hour, so sorry for the long-winded answers. Uh, I want to thank you all again. Uh, I think I'm the best qualified person for this office for a few reasons. Uh, one, I'm the only person with any election experience at all. The primary role of this office is to run our elections. Uh, I've been... I started this when I was 20. I actually was appointed the University of Louisville's election administrator for student government back in 1997 when I was 20 years old. I've been running elections for a long time. Uh, I know how to do it. I can do it competently. Uh, if I applied for Mrs. Henry's job as uh, Commissioner of Veterans, the first question they would ask me is, what relevant experience do you have? And I'd say, well, I don't have any veterans experience, but I've run elections my whole life. They'd say, well, thanks for coming in. Uh, I think the best qualified candidate to be your chief election official is the person who actually has election experience and, and perspective from having done this all over the country. Uh, so number one, I think those qualifications are important. I also think that have a candidate who will show up and engage is important. Uh, I've, I've made that criticism, uh, and I'll, I'll reiterate it. Uh, I'm very frustrated that we don't have a candidate running to be the chief civic advocate who bothers to meet with civic groups or take questions from the press. It's very disappointing. Uh, I wanted to run a campaign that I could be proud of, win or lose, and I could be at a fundraiser tonight, but I told my campaign manager, we're doing this. I, I really want to come and, and speak to a group that doesn't agree with me on everything. It, I learned from it, and I think it's good for me, and it's good for the process. Uh, I think I'm the best person for this job, having been on the Board of Elections. I worked in a bipartisan fashion with the Democratic members and the Republican members. I worked with Democratic county clerks, Republican county clerks, election officials, and, and this you know, we obviously talk about election officials uh, and issues in the context of ideology, but 99% of this stuff is not ideological. Uh, I'm not running for the legislature. So even if you disagree with, with me on a particular issue, the fact is I can't decide these things for the most part anyway. My job is to be an executive branch official and to actually run this department and actually help, uh, help run these elections. And so I think I'm the best person for that. 
If Mrs. Henry thought she was, I think she'd be here tonight. So again, I want to thank you for your generosity of time. I look forward to meeting you all afterward. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, that was Michael Adams, candidate for Secretary of State, and we thank him for being here tonight, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, our, our next guest is uh, Sherry Donahue. Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Sherry Donahue is the uh, Demo Democratic candidate for Kentucky Auditor of Accounts. Uh, Sherry has a degree in industrial engineering from Purdue University and most recently has been a cybersecurity strategic partnership director for Humana. She's born and raised in Louisville, she's a Kentuckian, and she's got lots and lots of experience in the cybersecurity field, so that's why we have her here tonight for questions. And welcome, Sherry, and thank you for coming. Thank you all very much. So yes, I'm Sherry Donahue. I am running to be state auditor. And um, just real quickly, a, a little background about myself. Um, I grew up in a small working class town just outside Louisville. My dad worked construction, and to help make ends meet, my mom worked at the Navy Weapons Station. I was inspired by my mom and the people she worked with, so I decided I wanted to go into engineering. So I earned my degree at Purdue, and then I came home and I worked for the Navy for 20 years, auditing multi-billion dollar weapon systems and managing classified intelligence contracts. So my job was to make sure our taxpayers got their money's worth, and that our men and women in uniform had safe and effective equipment to defend our nation. I, uh, I later on, I did some work with the FBI in cybersecurity and infrastructure protection. I was the national president of an organization called InfraGuard, and it's focused on, um, uh, we have 50,000 people across the country that are focused on infrastructure protection. And one of the things I found is that our infrastructure is stunningly vulnerable to attack. Um, later on, I did some work with Humana in cybersecurity, uh, helping to protect our customers' information. So when I think about why I'm running for auditor, I look at our, our lack of faith and that we have a, a lot of issues with our infrastructure, right? Um, so right now, when people think about auditing, it's not about those ledger books, those piles of paper like it was at one time. You know, this is the 21st century. It's about ones and zeros. Everything is electronic. Everything's done by computer. And that includes our, our voting, our electronic voting machines. So um, that's one of the things, two, two of the things I want to do. I want to audit our, our, uh, or make sure that our IT systems, our IT audits, are modernized, professionalized, and upgraded. And that extends to our voting machines. So. The auditor's office, in case you, you don't really know what the auditor does, and I get that question a lot, basically is to make sure that our taxpayer dollars are being used effectively, efficiently, and they're compliant with the, the things that they're supposed to be doing. So that includes all of the things, all of the IT systems that control our information, and it includes our electronic voting machines. So, um, and, and real quick, I just want to, um, to say that I feel like the trust is a big issue, and if we can improve the trust by, uh, by addressing the uh, voting machines, then that is going to go a long way. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to um, let you go and head ask me questions. Great. Thank you. And uh, as before, these questions are written just by me uh, and nobody else, uh, although I did ask, for again, for some input for some, from some uh, people at the law school. Uh, on May 15th of this year, before the primary, you wrote for the Louisville Kinder Courier Journal. You wrote, quote, the cornerstone of any democracy is the people having faith in it. Do you personally have faith in our democracy? I do because I believe in the idea of what our, our founding fathers fought for, stood for, what our military fights for every day. Um, I know that there are problems, and those are problems that people like myself, uh, people, the people that are running for office, uh, are wanting to fix. And 
as long as we have a government that responds to us, that cares about us, that will uh, listen to our, vo our votes and our voices, then it will work effectively. It is broken in a lot of ways right now uh, because we do have politicians in office that have been trying to scare us. They try to tell us that our government doesn't work. And for a lot of them that are in office right now, I feel like they've set out to break it so that it can't work. And when people are scared and they feel like it doesn't work, they are not going to go out and vote. They're going to think that their vote doesn't count. So that's why we need to make sure that we restore that faith, that people believe that their votes are being counted and that their government truly is there to work for them. But the fact that we still have the opportunity to go every two years, every four years and vote and elect the people that we want representing us, then our, doc our democracy is working. Okay, so just to press a little bit on that, so you personally have faith in our democracy, and yet you're also uh, running your campaign on the notion that lots of people don't have faith. Can you square those two positions for us? I can't. Um, I do know that there are problems. We basically have uh, the greatest country in the world based on the greatest ideal that it is about the people. We are governing ourselves by electing the people that represent us. But I do believe that there are people that feel like the government is not responding to them. And that's what I want to do. I want to help restore their faith that the government is responding to them. It, it does work, but people have lost that faith that it's working. Great. In 2016, in the 2016 election, we know that Russia hacked into voter registration databases in several states. Uh, there's no evidence that Russians hacked into voting machines or that vote totals were changed, but there is evidence that there's at least a handful of states and maybe a lot of the states that Russia was able to access voter registration databases. What specific actions will you take as auditor to secure Kentucky's voter registration lists? The voter registration lists are part of our IT systems, and we need to make sure that um, Improving our, our IT security audits, it's several things. It's a very comprehensive approach. It's personnel, it's uh, technology, and it's physical. So when, I'm going to first answer about the voting machines themselves. So we have machines. Well, I'm going to get the machines okay. in a little bit. So if you could just focus so on the registration the voting roles, first. That's we'll going the to machines. be about the same things that we're going to be doing when the county clerks, with the treasurer's offices, with, you know, all of the systems within the state that the auditor's office will be auditing. And um, it's going to fall under making sure that those systems are protected, that the systems are patched, that uh, there are firewalls, and there's training. There's so many things, comprehensive things that need to be done to protect our information. And so that is going to have to be done on that. Now, as far as taking information out, removing people from the voter rolls, those are things that it would not fall under the auditor's office to do. It's going to be making sure that the security of the system is intact. Okay, uh, along the same theme of the registration list, and we will get to the machines in just a, a few moments, but a few days before the 2018 midterm elections, the news organization ProPublica reported that Kentucky's online voter registration database was, quote, quote, ran software that could potentially expose information to hackers or enable access to sensitive files without a password. The Kentucky Secretary of State's office was quoted in that story saying, ProPublica's claims regarding Kentucky's website lack a complete understanding of the Commonwealth's full approach to security, which is multi-layered. Defenses exist within each layer to determine and block offending traffic. Do you think the Kentucky Secretary of State's office response was adequate? And what would you have done from the auditor's perspective in response to that report? As auditor, I would go in there and I would do a full and comprehensive evaluation of the system. I would have ordered that uh, from our IT specialist. Um, as far as the Secretary of State's response, I think what <coughs> her response was, was complete to what they had been doing and what their understanding was. The Secretary of State's office is responsible for the process of the elections. And the auditor's office, I feel, is responsible for the security of the IT systems. So that really should have been uh, addressed to the auditor. Uh, the silence is deafening. And I feel like the auditor should have made a statement about that at the time. Uh, this will this question, next question will be 
in part, again, about the Secretary of State's office, but I think falls into the auditor. And again, if you all have questions, please feel free to put them on cards, and I'll try to integrate uh, them throughout these questions as well. Um, Kentucky Secretary of State Allison Lundgren Grimes somewhat famously refused to turn over Kentucky's voter registration list to President Trump's commission on uh, election security and voter fraud. Um, although I, that is within the province of the Secretary of State's office, I'm curious if you supported her action in refusing to turn over that list. Uh, would you have disclosed information to the federal uh, commission in an effort to better secure our, our elections? That doesn't fall under the auditor's office, obviously. Um, yeah, I'm still curious in terms of from a security perspective a whether you think it was the correct decision uh, not to disclose the information. As auditor, I would not disclose any information. I, I came up in a military background. Uh, I've had a security clearance since 1990. And I have spent my entire career protecting information. So turning over information to someone that truly does not have a need to know, does not have a purpose for having it other than, uh, I feel like there was not a, a, a clear enough reason for requesting that information and um, it belongs to the state of Kentucky. So um, I would not have turned it over um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't believe she had, um, she was required to do so, honestly. All right, now let's talk about voting machines. Um, and it's kind of a multi-part question here. First, how would you verify the accuracy of the electronic voting machines? And second, as part of that, do you think it's a good idea that some counties in Kentucky use electronic-only voting machines, or would you support a move to more use of paper ballots? Well, first of all, paper ballots are not totally secure either, and we know that from history, right? Um, even if we had total paper ballots, when you report it, you're reporting electronically. Anytime you bring in the electronic uh, system, it's going to be hackable. Um, there are three vendors of voting machines that the state uses. And I've spoken with uh, two of them, and the third one I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with. Uh, but uh, one in particular supplies 94 of the 120 counties. When we have paper backups, that theoretically it's great because you can validate your votes however right now we're not using those paper ballots for backup or for validation they're just there that if there is a, a contested election they can be used for recounts um, as far as the all electronic voting I spoke with some folks in um, uh, in Eastern Kentucky County this weekend that were telling me that they had the touchscreen voting and that in 2018 they know when they did the touchscreen voting that it was showing that they were voting for somebody else, not the person they wanted to vote for. And there was a few people that were standing there said, yes, it happened to me too. And so they were trying, they, you know, who do we report that to? Nothing ever happened. We, we spoke with the precinct captain, we spoke to the county clerk and nothing ever happened. You know, Okay, so if that's a few people, that's going to be systematic. Well, here's the problem. Here's what happens. These touch screens, they're not calibrated. So you can be three or four centimeters off when you touch it thinking you're voting for one person. It's calibrated so it thinks you're voting for the other person. So what do we do about that? We have to make sure we have the resources, that we have professionals that do the calibration, that do the programming, that are constantly maintaining these machines. The problem is these counties only have so much money to buy the machines. When they buy them and then they keep them because you can't rebuy machines every year, that's too cost prohibitive. But then part of the cost is paying it off through the years and then also the fees to maintaining those systems. They're not being upgraded. They're not being patched. They're, they're hardware uh, vulnerabilities. When they're using operating systems that are outdated, some of them 15 years outdated, then there's always going to be that, um, that opportunity. You also have some that have been stored in public storage lockers in between elections. So a physical security is not there. You have the people that are programming the machines. Um, so I've spoken with, like I said, some of these vendors, and I've asked, do you do background checks on the people programming the machines? Do you have two-person integrity? Do you have more than one person that's programming it and delivering the disk? When you're recording the uh, results, 
you know, are, are, is it one person entering the information? Is it, you know, what are the, what's the process? So it is process and it is electronic, is technology. So it's a lot of areas that need to be addressed. But when we know that there are problems out there, the issues of voter ID is minuscule compared to what the vulnerabilities are when it comes to our electronic voting machines. So let me just uh, press you a little bit to make sure I understand. Uh, would you do you support increased use of electronic voting machines or would you prefer increased use of paper ballots i support increased use of security of those machines so and that means more so resources mach more machines but but better security with better them. security better machines more security more people involved in protecting them and, and if that means more money to go towards buying better machines to make sure we have more people involved the experts in updating them patching them then yes and, and if, if paper ballots are uh, the answer then yes let, let's get the machines that have those some of these counties that have these touchscreen only machines they have them for a while and they can't afford to buy newer machines because they are cost prohibitive um, can currently, let, let's talk about after the election now. So currently, Kentucky does a post-election audit, again, done by the Secretary of State's office, so we're talking uh, a little bit outside of what the auditor currently does, um, but I'm still curious for your review. So uh, it's a post-election audit of results that essentially is a spot check. Ra counties are chosen at random to uh, spot check results. From the auditor's perspective, would you, would you involve the auditor's office in post-election uh, audits, and uh, how would you go about verifying the accuracy of the results after election day? I think it should be a very comprehensive approach, absolutely. I think that we need to get experts in IT security involved and be part of the process of looking at these machines to making sure that they are operating correctly, that we, you know, whether it's going to be um, evaluating the machines before they're actually used for the voting. Um, you know, there are processes that can be implemented. And as far as laws, if we had laws that required specific things, if it required paper ballots or if it required updates, um, then these vendors would be doing that. They're not going to uh, normally do something above and beyond what they're required to do. So if our, our legislators require paper backups, if they required updates to the patching, then these vendors would do that. Um, but until then, we need to get more people involved in the security of the machines and be part of that process of auditing the votes. Let's talk about um, the access versus integrity debate when it comes to running our elections. So measures to ward off cybersecurity issues or election fraud sometimes come at the expense of making it harder for voters to participate in elections. I'm thinking about uh, greater scrutiny of voter registration lists that might capture valid voters and have them be purged or what have you. So my question is this, do you support stronger cybersecurity measures that might involve extra hoops for voters to jump through? I think that we can do cybersecurity measures that do not put uh, a greater burden on the voters. There are ways to do that without requiring people to have to go online and, and, and do those things because we, we have a lot of voters that don't have that, uh, that luxury of being able to go online. So I think as long as we can improve the security from the uh, election machine side, then the voter registration side of, of that process, that will fall under the Secretary of State's office. My concern is what can be done uh, on the electronic side. Can you be a little more specific in terms of what you mean by what can be done? As far as are we, are we you know, uh, patching? Are we putting firewalls in? Are, do we have the most up-to-date machines? Are we maintaining them? Are we protecting them between elections? There are so many things that can be done from you know, making sure that the machines themselves are secure. And then as far as who votes, that needs to be fall under the Secretary of State's office. Sure. Do you, um, do you believe that the Kentucky elections have been properly, the results have been properly um, determined? Do you believe in, the, we're talking about the voting machines, do you believe that the results are accurate of Kentucky elections? I don't think the results of any election are accurate because of the introduction of electronic voting machines and even going back, like I said, even paper ballots. You know, there's always a way to hack the system even if it's not electronic. Um, but are they, is it st statistically significant? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And that is something that I want to find out and I will find out in an audit.
Okay, this, is a, this, is, this question is sort of a follow-up to that, actually. In September 2018, the New York Times published an article titled, The Crisis of Election Security. And the sub-headline of that article was, as the midterms approach, America's electronic voting systems are more vulnerable than ever. What I why isn't anyone trying to fix them? So the question is this, how would you make election security a priority for Kentucky citizens? We talked a little bit about what you would do, but this is on the kind of civic education aspect of it. How would you make what you're talking about with respect to uh, verifiability and stronger cybersecurity for Kentucky elections an actual priority for Kentucky citizens and voters? Educate them and get them to elect me. <laughs> uh, yeah, education, if really. You, yeah, be more specific but about what kind of education to keep them informed of how important it is that these systems are uh, updated and protected. Truly, you know, I, I talked about the importance of our infrastructure and how vulnerable our infrastructure is. Um, there are 16 infrastructures as identified by the Department of Homeland Security. And within the last year, there's been a new organization stood up specifically about election infrastructure that our elections are one of our most important infrastructures because it is what our democracy is based on, is the ability to elect our leaders. If people understand that, as, as I go out and I speak to people, it is overwhelming how many people are in, in just full-throated agreement with me about the need for cybersecurity of our state uh, systems and especially our voting machines. They understand that. When I have people coming up to me at a picnic in eastern Kentucky on a Saturday afternoon saying, I want to talk to you. You need to know about our voting machines here in this county. When I click on that touch screen and it shows somebody else, who do I call? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make sure that my vote was properly counted. The more that we can educate people, whether it's through groups like this, through League of Women Voters, through the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, whoever it might be, to let voters know. It's your responsibility, uh, definitely, to be educated voters, but to make sure that you feel like when you go in to vote, your vote is being properly counted, and if you feel like it's not, have somebody you can go to. Okay, is that the county clerks? Do we get the county clerks involved in giving a, a hotline number to when you're voting on November 5th, if you feel like you're, you're questioning your vote that it went through, you need to be able to call this office and make sure. I don't know what the, the, the right answer is other than I feel like our, our electorate needs to be engaged and informed for so many reasons, um, and that being one of them. This uh, comes from the audience, and it's kind of along the same themes. How would you be able to work, say you're elected and let's say there's a handful of statewide uh, officials that are Republican who are elected or the state legislature is Republican, you're the Democratic nominee, how would you be able to work with the state government to ensure paper records for each vote and for all the other initiatives that you're discussing? When I worked for the Navy, I worked under two Republican presidents and two Democrat presidents. Those men were my commander in chief but I worked for the sailors, and I worked for the taxpayers. Just like with Heather French Henry, I would like to say that she is a very um, educated, experienced, intelligent woman who has done a lot for this state and for this country and our veterans. She has worked very hard for them, and she has, has made sure that they had the opportunity for voting in these uh, veterans' uh, nursing homes where she's been. She's worked under Republican and Democrat governors. She knows how to get the job done. On these, or these constitutional officers, it's about getting the job done, not about being partisan. To that end, there's a mission. There's a job to do. I will work with whomever is in the office to make sure that we're doing what is best for our voters, for our, for our citizens. So as far as making sure that what, where and I'm working with a county clerk, regardless of what the party is, the issue is about making sure our elections are secure. It's about making sure our information is secure. And so it, it, that, that is what matters. It doesn't matter what party uh, someone is, because I can tell you right now, under my leadership, the auditor's office is going to fearlessly search out waste, fraud, and abuse, wherever it is, and whoever's responsible for it. And that includes making sure that your vote is, is heard and counted. Uh, another question from the audience, not on elections. Um, the question is, would you audit Kentucky's county jails, as discussed in the Herald-Leader series on this issue? 
Absolutely. Um, I have spoken with a few jailers. I've been to the jailers conference and uh, spoken with folks about there's a concern about some of these audits that are done that when uh, s there's some specifically uh, that ask me examples where they have called the auditor's office to ask questions about how they can spend their money on specific things and they've been told we can't give you the advice. And so they say, well, how do we know what we can or can't do? And the auditor's office has told them, when we come out to do the audit, we'll let you know if what you did was right or wrong. <laughs> Seriously? So um, I want to make sure that the auditor's office is there to provide guidance, to provide assistance, and to make sure that when we're going out, it's not seen as, oh my god, here they come, you know, let's make sure that we pass this. That's part of the, uh, the cybersecurity things I'm wanting to do. It's also about guidance. It's about best practices. And the jails, that's all part of it, too. We need to make sure that the way they're being run is in compliance with the use of our tax dollars properly being executed. Okay, back on elections uh, for a moment. Do you fear Russian or other foreign country interference in our elections? Absolutely. And uh, we've talked about well, the electronic uh, voting machines and the voter registration list, anything you'd want to add about how you'd make sure that Kentucky would not be a victim of that kind of interference? The more information that we have, the better. Um, like I said, when I came up, um, you know, in my career, uh, a, lot of, a lot of time I did some intelligence work, and part of my job was, based on what our technologies were with the Navy, I had to know which countries wanted to steal our information. Depending on the country, they all had different ways of doing it. And, depending on the country, they had different reasons for doing it. Your adversary is not always the same. It may not always be the Russians. It could be another party. It could be a third party we don't know about. It could be somebody just trying to have fun. You know, uh, one of these kitty hackers, right? So, regardless of what it is, we need to have a better understanding and we need to always be on top of the newest threats that are coming down the pike. And that means information. I have, like I said, I, I led a 50,000-person fi organization all across the country. One of my proudest moments um, was after 9-11, I developed the process the FBI now uses to coordinate domestic security information. And it was based on a pilot program that I did here in Kentucky. I know how to look at the problems, use the resources we have, and develop a process. And I know how to expand that across the country. I also know that I have, uh, there's a lot of things I don't know, but I know people that can help me. I have uh, people in New York, in Michigan, and several other states have worked in uh, state government and have done things to improve their cybersecurity that I will be talking with and helping me. I've got engaged with this uh, election infrastructure group. You know, what is it that is being done with the voting machines in other states that we can use as best practices? Okay. Uh, yep, we've got two more questions, and then uh, we'll have time for closing, closing okay. statements. All right. Um, uh, we are. We talked as well beforehand about uh, our closing <laughs> statement time, so we're, we're good. I'm watching the clock. Um, similar question I asked Mr. Adams. Your opponent, Republican nominee and incumbent Mike Harmon, is not here tonight. But if you were, what would you say to him? And one, what what would you ask him? Um, I would say, um, good job on the Jeff Foxworthy impersonation. Um, <laughs> and um, I feel like a lot of there's a lot of work to be done in the auditor's office. There is not enough has been done. And um, there are a lot of questions that should have been asked about the pension system that haven't been asked. And that goes beyond transparency. There's been a lot of uh, questions that should have been answered and that haven't been about our um, incentive packages for things like Brady Industries. When we have these companies coming in and they're given these tax breaks, these bonuses, and they make promises to hire people and to bring economic value to the communities, and they don't, and they're getting these humongous tax breaks, and our people aren't benefiting from it, that money, those incentives are our tax dollars. Those are the things that I feel like questions aren't being asked. Um, I feel like that regardless of political party, the auditors should have been doing more 
to ask questions of this administration. All right, lightning round for fun. Popeyes or Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A. Pizza or tacos? Tacos. Alexander Hamilton or Aaron Burr? <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. Cats or dogs? Oh, dogs. <laughs> Kentucky basketball or Louisville basketball? Yes. I'm going to have to press you on that answer a little bit. Uh, I'll let that one slide. All right, time for your closing statement. You have five minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I know this was a, a forum about voting, and that is a big part of my platform about the voting machines. But truly, if you look around, people are losing faith in our government. Regardless of your ideology or your political affiliation, people lose faith because in order for a democracy to work, we have to have faith that our government cares about us, that our government will effectively respond to our needs, and that our voices and our votes will be heard and counted. I do care. As auditor, I will respond to your needs, and I will always listen to you. I am uniquely qualified to be auditor. I think you know that from my background, 30 years in the public and private sector, national programs I've run. And I can tell you, and I like to reemphasize this, that yes, under my leadership, your auditor's office will fearlessly search out waste, fraud, and abuse wherever it is and whoever is responsible for it, Democrat, Republican, or other. I will audit the electronic voting machines, make sure your vote is counted. I will modernize and professionalize our state cybersecurity audits. Because regardless of whether you're on the internet or not, your information is, right? Your name, your address, your social security number, your date of birth. If a hacker had access to that, think about what they could do. It's very scary. And I don't want to be here to scare people, but I want you to understand what's at stake. And that we need somebody to put emphasis on that. Because it's not a question of if we are going to be attacked, but when. And I can tell you, we are stunningly unprepared right now. We have someone in uh, the, uh, heading up the state CIO, or uh, Commonwealth Office of Technology office, who's a friend of our governor. The governor got a law change to give him a raise, and he makes $375,000 a year. Most of, we have $70 billion in state and federal taxes that come in and out of our accounts every year. And we have a CIO that doesn't even know how many servers we have or if they've been backed up. And when the governor was asked about it, he just flippantly said, I dare anyone to find anybody in IT that knows more than this man does. Well, I can tell you for 30 years in public and private sector, I know dozens of people. So governor, if you're watching, I have names and phone numbers. <laughs> so, again, since I was in my early 20s, I have stood up to billion-dollar defense contractors and to the military-industrial complex, and I've always won. So I can tell you that people like Matt Bevan and his friends, they do not scare me. For so long, we have had politicians that have tried to scare us, telling us government doesn't work, and they've tried to break it so that it can't work, and that is not fair. The Commonwealth deserves better. Kentucky families deserve better. A government that works for you is what we will provide on this Democratic ticket. So we will work for you. We will fight for you. I thank you because I know that together we can restore that faith in our government. So I appreciate the opportunity tonight. God bless you and your families. Ed. Bill, thank you, Sherry. Since, since we have another minute or two, can I just add one thing really quickly? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Ms. Donahue. Thank you again, Mr. Adams. Um, I had the pleasure of going all over the country uh, this summer to talk about my book, and one of the most common questions I was asked was, how are you so optimistic about our democracy? You know, I wrote, you wrote a book about, about good news in voting in elections, and my answer is this tonight. We have a room full of people engaged. We have two candidates engaged. And so I just want to tell you all how much I appreciate as someone who teaches this subject and writes about it, to have a room full of people who are coming out and spending their, it's a Tuesday, Tuesday evening uh, to talk about issues, to talk about ideas. This is what sustains our democracy no matter who you vote for. So I just want to say thank you. You are my answer to that question of why I'm optimistic about democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, 
Ms. Susan Perkins Weston. Susan comes to us today from the Kentucky League of Women Voters. She's a graduate of Swarthmore College and Yale Law School. Currently she works on educational issues in Kentucky, focusing on data and policy issues. She is the lead author in the League Redistricting Report. She's been a Danville resident in Kentucky since 1990. And where is she? Oh, there you are. Oh, come on up. Okay, there you go. It's all yours. Okay. Just dancing. Have I got this at a good angle? Yes. I, I, oh, sure. I, I know it's a challenge. I'm delighted to be here this evening. I have done the 25 page version of the report. I've finally been compelled by my colleagues to get to the two page version. I've done the 30-minute presentation, it's really good to be pressed to get to the shorter version. But I will warn you, you're slightly guinea pigs on the timing. So I want to try to share a handful of thoughts, and I brought maps so I can show you a couple of examples. And I'm skipping PowerPoint as part of the goal of 10 minutes. A few basic points, if we can start with what is redistricting, super short version. It's the process by which, under our Constitution, we count the population every 10 years. That's an actual original document founders thing. And then each state is told by the federal government how many seats it can have in the House. And each state then decides who will be in each of those allowed districts and also redraws the lines for the State Senate and the State House. And many, many other government bodies redraw many, many other lines. But I'll focus pretty heavily on thinking about Congress and our state legislature as the biggest issues people are most familiar with. This matters because we have a constitutional commitment in Kentucky to our elections being fair and equal. That's Article 6. It's very short. All elections shall be fair and equal. I memorized that since I walked into the room. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, it matters because when we draw districts that work for people, it's easier to participate. It's easier to find candidates and learn about them. It's easier to contact your own legislators once they're elected. It's easier for people to communicate if the districts are done well. And it matters because we have an important history in this country of that power to draw lines having been used to exclude people, particularly people of color, from having a shot at electing people they support. So it's important that we work on doing the redistricting well. That's my whole pitch for why it's important. A few key rules to know. At the federal level, you're probably familiar with the classic one person, one vote rule, which is a 1960s interpretation of the 14th Amendment. That's pivotal. That federal districts are supposed to be very, very, very close to the same size. Um, we have, from interpretation of the Voting Rights Act, a more specific legal requirement that redistricting provide districts of opportunity for racial and linguistic minorities. That's an interpretation of the requirements of the Voting Rights Act, but it's been holding strong in the courts so far. We do not have a rule at the federal level on partisan drawing of districts. We're not going to get one. That's the main ruling of this spring, was the Supreme Court said, we can't figure out how to say the Democrats went too far in Maryland, the Republicans went too far in Wisconsin. We're not going to try. I mean, it's, that door looks like it's closed for challenging districts on the basis of partisan considerations. Those are the big federal rules. I actually want to spend a little time on the big Kentucky rule that's added to that. Our Constitution from 1892 says don't split counties. Just don't. Our Supreme Court was faced with, yeah, but 14th Amendment equal protection. Their answer is split as few counties as possible. So draw the lines to get essentially equal districts, but see how few counties you can split. The way that works out is every district large enough to split gets used to solve all the other problems, right? 
Franklin County is big enough to be split. Franklin County is therefore a piggy bank for solving other problems. Reach in and take some voters. On the maps, I want to show you a few examples on the House side. If you look way down in the west of the state, you get the easiest example, which is McCracken County up here at the top where Paducah is, has clearly been used to solve multiple problems. You add up all four counties on the Mississippi, they don't make a complete district. So here come some voters from McCracken County. Gray's was almost big enough, but not big enough. Let's take some voters from McCracken County. If you add up Marshall and Lyon, they're almost big enough, but not quite. So where do we go? Let's take some voters from McCracken County. For Franklin, the taking was smaller and simpler. Woodford wasn't big enough to be a district, so voters were pulled out of Franklin to work with Woodford, which is fair if we're trying for kind of equal districts. And then also voters were pulled from Fayette County to make a district. Fayette, on the other hand, got pulled every which way. I'm not going to argue heartily that this is unjust, but I think people need to see it happening. It probably does have implications for relatively urban counties that they're going to be sliced up. And if you'll switch to the Senate map for a minute, Jefferson County is way up here in the top corner. And if you'll find District 14, which is in pink in the corner, and you see a little bit in Jefferson, you can see a little in Spencer, but if you go to the big map, it actually goes down into Spencer, Nelson, Marion, and Casey, which is due south of here. Right? That's, that's one of the more startling ones where they use Jefferson to solve a problem with districting for Casey. That, I think, is going to be an important discussion. In general, I think the Supreme Court argument kind of works for fitting our Constitution and the federal Constitution together. But I still think people should be pressing on, is it really necessary to do it this divided and particularly this wiggly? And I will show you one I'm willing to call out that I don't think was done in a way I'd want to defend, which is on the Jefferson House map. If you look up here at the top at Oldham County, Oldham had to be split up. Some Oldham County voters had to go somewhere. But they took three slices and put them in Jefferson County districts, three different fingers poking up. And I'm pretty sure I can figure out that that could have been done to be simpler and easier for voters to know who they're voting for, for candidates to know where their districts are, for everyone to communicate. That one I'm willing to say I'm pretty sure there's not a robust justification for that one. I try not to say that very often, but I want to alert you to that problem. That county issue explains a lot of what's in our maps. We don't really have districts that look like Donald Duck kicking Goofy, which is one of the famous Pennsylvania districts. They're, they're more reasonable than that, and the requiring counties to be held together when they can be helps a bunch. But we do have that running issue of those little splintered pieces. The other thing that has factored heavily in our maps is protecting incumbents. Um, I don't know that that went into every district. I do know that Represent Senator Robinson told me directly his district had fewer people in the last redistricting, so they just added a county, and he got to choose the county. That's the blunt version of we're doing this to keep incumbents. And particularly in the Senate map, that gets you these very long, skinny districts that sort of look like pearls on a string or a, a locomotive pulling a set of cars. They aren't very well connected. So those are, are challenges we've had in how things have been done. One other challenge to alert you to is we expect the census, and we know the census will be done in 2020. The last date I heard for the data coming out is January 1, 2021. Earlier, I'd heard April. That's been recent history. Once that happens, the legislature has to move through the process of making the decisions. But it seems very unlikely they can do it in a 30-day session in 2021. 
In 2022, they have four days before the filing deadline, four. They convene on the 3rd of January, the filing deadline is the 7th. So either we have a special session, which is really hard for citizens to participate in because they try to make it very quick, or they do it in four days, or they tell us, oh, we're not gonna have new districts until 2024, which is a little odd if you know the districts aren't constitutionally right coming into 2022. So to move us just to the league's recommendations for citizen advocacy, our top concerns are pushing for public input opportunities at an important scale, which means starting before the legislature convenes in some way, working on getting a later filing deadline so we have a chance of having it work for 2022, uh, asking legislators to commit to design rules, and we think the important ones are that deep classic of districts that are equal in size, uh, looking for compact, competitive districts where we can do it so people have to argue with each other rather than saying the primary winner, it's done. Um, not focusing on incumbents. We really think we should let that go because the, when incumbents have that role of choosing, they're choosing the voters instead of the voters choosing them. Drawing the maps to keep the incumbents we think is a mistake. Um, and we really think we should continue to focus on those districts of opportunity for racial and linguistic minorities. Final thing we want to encourage legislators to do, which is more of a policy attitude, is look for maps that can have bipartisan support by something more than a, the smallest possible majority. Look for something that we can all have confidence in. We think an independent commission would be a great way to do it. We think an advisory commission is more feasible. Um, independent commission isn't possible in Kentucky on any short notice because it would have to go through a constitutional amendment process, starting from the legislator saying, take our power from us, please. <laughs> right, we don't have initiative and referendum. You can't do a petition to get something on the ballot here. So that you'd have to have the House vote take our power. You'd have to have the Senate vote take our power, and then it would go to the voters. So independent commission is pretty much impossible. Advisory commissions are very possible, and in fact, a respected member of the legislature is working on the concept. Representative Gravis. <laughs> I was, I thought, I decided I wasn't yet authorized to tell you about this bill, but the simplest way to let you know one of the ideas that's floating right now is by asking the man working on it to tell you a bit about what he's proposing. Thank you, thank you, Susan. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, redistricting is a, is a huge deal. Uh, my name is Joe Gravis. I'm the representative from the 56th district. And we uh, are just after free and fair elections that, that is modeled after um, what the K Kentucky Constitution calls for. And I feel like that uh, one of the candidates tonight, uh, Mr. Adams, uh, was correct in that there's a lot of dysfunction and distrust uh, and despair. Uh, about our political system uh, and I think th the way that the politicians have been allowed to pick their voters uh, has created a lot of that problem and and both sides uh, are equally as guilty in that and I think in the 21st century uh, to try to put some some equity back into the system uh, we should uh, allow uh, an independent uh, council advisory board to uh, do that uh, and draw the lines. The technology exists. Uh, and so we have um, drafted a proposed bill that is based on um, the League of Women Voters model. I think that they have the, the, the fairest, uh, most well thought out model that could work in Kentucky. Uh, but the, the party, whoever is in power, whenever the 10 years has come around, has been very loath to give up uh, their red pen. And I think that uh, that tradition has a very good chance of continuing unless the citizens really make a strong case that they want uh, the, the lines drawn based on population, not party. And so that's really gonna take a lot of effort on your part and the viewer's part. 
And so if, if last session, I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails, literally, on wine shipping. And I think redistricting deserves thousands and thousands of emails. Uh, so please, uh, uh, please contact your, your legislators. Uh, you don't have to contact me unless you want to, because I'm there. Uh, anytime you know my door is open I've already spoken to, to many of you on many different occasions you see me all over town I'm very accessible and available uh, but when you call the legislative hotline um, when you send those uh, green slips and those emails and you, and, uh, you visit the legislators in person particularly now when we're not in session really make it a priority because if it's not a priority on your part trust me it is not going to be a priority on their part so thank you very much Okay, can you hear me? Okay, do we have, do we have questions for um, Susan? Questions at all concerning redistricting? Yes, did you fill out a card or do you just need to come down there? All right, let me come down here and give you the What's microphone. Your Hi, Bruce Maples, Forward, Kentucky. Um, I wanted to check my memory with you because mm -hmm. I think maybe you can help me remember this correctly. But as I recall, in 2010, when we had the 2010 census and then we had the redistricting, we had split control in Frankfurt. And so we had a House that was controlled by the Democrats and Senate controlled by the Republicans. And each of them, as I recall, drew the districts for the other. And they both, or they wound up fighting about it and both of them getting thrown out in court, basically saying, if you don't accept this, we'll draw yours funny. And because we had split, and now we don't, we have one party controlling Frankfurt. And does that cause a greater concern about gerrymandering, not because it's the Republicans, but because it's one party? I don't quite remember it that way. I don't remember the, the crossing. My understanding was the House was drawing House lines, the Senate was drawing Senate lines. It definitely got thrown out by the state Supreme Court on the basis of they split too many counties and they didn't get the districts as close enough to equal. This was a funny fight. They wanted all the districts to be within 10, within 10 percent of each other, and the Supreme Court said, no, it has to be within 5 percent of perfection on either side. So it's like they had it was four on one side, six on the other, and they said, no, within 5 percent either side, uh, and it got thrown out, and they came back and did it in five days fastest you can do without waving three readings. Boom, boom, boom. Um, almost impossible for citizens to catch up with the bill that was simple. Redistricting bills are hard to read. I think there's probably more risk if we still have uh, unified government of one party running things over. On the other hand, I don't see how anyone argues against that without admitting we had one party government for a very long time before. Um, one of the amusements here, there's a lot, there was a lot of analysis on partisan grounds of how does the popular vote compare to how the legislature comes out. In 2016, I haven't done the 2018 numbers, in 2016, uh, Republicans got 60 percent of the vote and 64 percent of the seats, but of course it was lines drawn by Democrats. So it was pretty tough to see that as a problem. I, I I think it's easier for people if they don't have checks and balances to go the first place they think of to go. Um, the important check is citizens pushing them, I think. All right. Do, any more questions for uh, Susan? Redistricting, a really, really big deal right now. The census is in 2020. They're going to redraw the lines and make decisions about who gets to vote where. And that is something that is incredibly, incredibly important. It's a complicated issue, as you can tell, but it's something we have to pay attention to. And any more questions for Susan? All right. Susan, thank you so much. Won wonderful to be thank after you for two being other here. great presentations. That's Joe, great. glad you were here for be Johnny on the spot. Thank, thank you for being here. And uh, of course, uh, uh, for. Uh, 
you know, anybody that wants to talk about redistricting from the other party, we are we have a meeting on October 15th and they're welcome to be here. Okay, so that's the way we're handling that. Um, I'm definitely not from a party. <laughs> no, I know good, that, right. but Joe is. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. good. <laughs> so I know you're not. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Together Frankfurt is uh, strictly nonpartisan. We're just an educational uh, uh, committee and a, a group. Okay, so I'm going to put this down. No, I, th I think you've got. A, I still think you've got a good uh, audience, Jeff. This is uh, Jeff Hancock. Jeff, Jeff is our uh, Franklin County uh, native. He's our here's our local boy, and he's our uh, current Franklin County clerk. He graduated from Franklin High right here, Moorhead University, and he supervises Franklin County voter registration and performs election duties for all the precincts in Franklin County. He's the guy that makes sure that we get it done right here in our community. So, Jeff, thank you very much. Yeah, do you want to use the mic or you want to come over here? Okay, all right. Jump in there. Is this on? Yes. Okay, I'll stand up and talk, actually. It made me feel better because I, I really, truthfully, thought after you all heard all these great people speaking that at this point you ought to have gone home. I, um, Mr. Adams and Ms. Donahue, thank you for being here tonight. I want to tell you, along with uh, Representative Gravis, the biggest problem that, all, that you all all brought to the table is funding. We continue to bring up these election issues and cybersecurity issues, but until the House of Representatives and the State Senate decides to fund our needs, there's nothing we can do. The counties are bearing all the burden of the cost of these elections. And until we get some type of funding out there, there's nothing that we can do. Um, so I thank you for being here, and I hope you're hearing that loud and clear out there. Um, without funding, there, there, we, we can't move forward. Well, I do need to be up there. Okay, I, can't, I can't make heads or tails of my own notes here. Um, I was got, actually got to ask a couple of questions by Murray. She sent me the questions instead of Mr. Douglas standing up here and drilling me because I'm pretty sure he would have caught me uh, not being able to answer his questions. So, uh, yeah. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Not at all. Uh, first off, a couple things. Um, she wanted to know, uh, Ms. Woods, did I ask what the total registered voters in Franklin County are? And right now we stand at 35,904 registered voters for Franklin County. I'm going to give you a little bit of history um, from 2014, which was the local elected official through 2019 current time. Um, Franklin County does quite a bit better than the state and averaging just under 47%. I do want to give you a number that you need to probably pay attention to. Um, in the last state election, we and which would have been 2015, we voted in the primary 30.5%. It was our lowest turnout that we had seen historically um, in Franklin County. But we turned around this year with a percentage of 40.4%. So I believe we're re-engaging um, our voting citizens and our voting people. And I, it's, I think that it, the most important thing that we can do is all get out and be involved. Um, the questions that Murray sent me, um, I just went over the voter registration. Um, elections, um, lowest turnout being statewide, the highest turnout being presidential at 52.3%, and the local elected officials coming in with a 50% uh, vote total. Um, and actually, your local elected officials had a higher primary turnout traditionally than any other election that you had. So you're getting out pretty good in the primary, but we're falling off a little bit in the general. The security of voting machines was uh, a big topic and that you've talked about it quite a bit tonight. Um, we are blessed in Franklin County to have a, all of our voting equipment not hadn't been that way except for in 2016 when they built the new sheriff's office. The fiscal court saw the need um, that we had 
and um, that the boating equipment had been at <laughs> it had been at the um, the garage for um, the the mechanics garage. It had had no tempering. It had been beat up for ten years, and um, they saw a need. And especially with the cost of what we have for election equipment, they went in and put a secured room in the sheriff's office that is behind triple redundant lock and key. And the only people that have passwords to it are the Franklin County Board of Elections. So your actual voting equipment is super secure. Um, as equipment goes, um, our equipment is aging. It is 10 to 12 years old. The software is obsolete. It will only continue to break and go down a, a rough path. Here's the problem, exactly what I was talking about earlier. We have to fund the election equipment. If we can't find the funding, and with the county cannot burden the cost. We're right now trying to figure out what to do with pensions as a county and how to balance our own budgets to pick up an extra between $750,000 and $850,000 for election equipment is just not in the cards right this second. Um, I have put a program together that we will make it through this election um, with the equipment we have. I hope to make it through the presidential. And then as you all, all know, in that 2020 year or 2021 year is an off year. That's the year I expect to take the money from the elections of the county, the money from the election on our side of it, along with some other funds and some excess fees and be able to purchase new election equipment. Um, all, all election costs are upfront county cost you know most people don't realize that we do get some reimbursement back from the state board of elections the secretary of state's office but it averages about 10 to 15 percent of the total cost so your county government is burdening the cost for all the rest of it um, uh, something that was said that was a little confusing i was a little thrown off there are three different election equipment vendors I'm not sure which ones are the touch screens that are falling over, you know, moving the votes over and across. You don't have any of that in Franklin County. As you know, you have either the roll dial and or the paper machines. Um, and quite frankly, if we, the biggest problem with the roll dial is it's the only ADA accessible piece of equipment we have. And those are the, they're called the e-slates. The e-slates are going down quicker than I can band-aid them together. So if we went straight paper, we would, be, we would not be ADA compliant. And I, I, for one, as your county clerk, will not allow that to happen. So that's why we haven't gone 100% papers because our paper option is not ADA compliant. Um, the question was asked, how often do we purge the voter rolls? Short answer to this is, I don't. Um, the reason I don't do it is because it's a state task. They took it out of our hands. Um, your County Board of Elections was originally set up to do this task. The reason they put the County Board of Elections is, is so you could go through the Sunday paper, you could collect them all, do the obituaries, and go through and purge your voter rolls. Um, in today's time, that does not happen. That's not our function, nor do we ever look at them, or do we ever take anyone out. The State Board of Elections does go back to your vital statistics, and they do take out um, your deceased voters. But uh, we do not do that from the county level. I will tell you, we communicate directly with the State Board of Elections. If we see incorrect data, we do get it with them. Sometimes it does get taken out, sometimes it does not. But we do not purge the voter rolls. Um, the um, State Board of Elections recently did a 600,000 postcard mailer. Um, they received roughly over half of those back. Um, and I'm really, quite frankly, I'm not sure what they're doing with that voter information and voter data. Um, next question that was asked was, uh, who determines precincts and thoughts on merging precincts? Um, several com things come to light when it talks about merging precincts. I, for one, precincts were put in place because of divides. They weren't just fictitiously put out there. Precincts were put into place for representative and senator boundaries, magisterial boundaries, city boundaries, population, geographic reasons. So as precincts go, I'm not really all that interested in merging precincts. What I would like to see from the county level 
and I'm very interested in this. I believe Mr. Adams um, alluded to this. I wanna see voting centers. Um, the new equipment that we will have to purchase from the county level will be able to accept um, ballots from multiple positions, divide them out, make sure they go to the right precinct, make sure that everybody gets the right ballot. The, the ability's there right now. Um, if we went, and in my ideal world, you would have a voting center. We would not get, guys, we wouldn't get rid of all 44 voting locations, but I would have a central Frankfurt voting location at the KSU Exum Center that would have 10 locations, one at the Franklin County High School, one at Western Hills, and then I would still have all my outliers, the ones that are out there directly in the communities that are the Schweitzers, that are um, Peaks Mills, that are the Bald Knobs. I would still hold my traditional outskirt precincts because I'm just not gonna expect people to drive 20 miles into town to vote. So we would still hold those, but what we would do is get rid of the precinct or the voting precincts. If you put a pin on Franklin County High School, I have 11 vote, different voting stations within one mile. There's no reason, I mean, why well, I can't take every one of them to Franklin County School and get the equipment that we have set up so, so we can have everybody adequately vote and save taxpayer money and the cost of the county with the, the amount of equipment we need. Um, there are any suggestions on how to improve voter turnout? Right now I'm running a pilot through Franklin County I'm uh, running all the elections for third through eighth grade students at Frankfurt Independent School. I'm doing this in hopes to be able to do it for all the schools, third through 12th. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna, get, I wanna get our youth used to voting. If they think they're supposed to vote every year and they're supposed to know what they're voting for and who they're voting for, then they'll, they'll be voters for life. But we have to start them young. So I'm starting this with the Frankfurt Independent School System and I hope to have, by next year, I hope to have it countywide. <laughs> Guys, I didn't take all my time, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. Well, that's what we have. I've uh, got a couple here. Okay. Got a question about uh, uh, felons. Should the name of a convicted felon who lives in Franklin County be automatically removed from the voter registration list and not receive follow-up postcards and not be able to see their name on a list? That's for a bigger policymaker than me. I follow the laws. I make sure that every vote that is allowed to be cast gets cast. Um, I'll leave that for Joe Gravis and, and the folks up at the... I'm, I'm not trying to elude the question, but overall I feel like that's for the legislative body. That's a legislation question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very fair enough. All right. Uh, the 2017 census. Okay. This is the second question. Estimates Franklin County population is 50,485. Uh, if the number of registered voters is 35,904, the question is how can 71% of the population be registered voters? Well, some people are not qualified to be registered voters at this point. They're under the age of 18. So you have to put in your population as a total totality is there are kids under the age of 18 that figure in the po full population of 50,000. Okay, are there other groups that aren't included in the, I guess the felons would not be included? They would not be included, but it, my figures are, are direct figures from the Secretary of State site from our DRS system. Okay, are there other, are there other groups of people that are not allowed to be voters? Non-U.S. citizens. Non-U.S. citizens? Yes, sir. Okay. So there you have it. Does that answer that question? And people who haven't registered. And people who haven't registered. There is a small part of the population that just is not registered and don't want to be registered. There's a, there, believe it or not, there's a group that just have no interest in, um, you know, something else we do. We go to voter drives. We do two voter drives at Western Hills, Franklin County, and Frankfort High, and KSU every year. So we're getting out there in front of the kids. We're doing our best to make sure that we're getting to the, to, to everybody that wants to be registered to vote, we're getting out in front of them. Okay, we have a question back here. Considering that the governor would be the person to sign um, restoration of voting rights request and that uh, your county clerk, would you be willing to sign letters of support for them uh, while we try to tackle that overall res restoration issue that we have? Absolutely. It would depend on each individual case, though. It would depend on each individual yes, case? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. 
Patricia? Um, given that we do have a university within our um, city, within our county, uh, would you support granting KSU students slash college students early voting on campus due to early May graduations and November date falls on Tuesdays, classes are still in session, and sometimes the students will not return for that voting day. Um, at this time, being a student, it's hard sometimes to get to voting. They have classes all day long, and I think it's unfair for us to register them to vote here. As you said, you're on campus twice, but then our voting day is literally two weeks in the primary after they graduate, and that is students that are not voting. I've been, uh, I just visited uh, Penn State a few months ago, and they have early voting on their campus. I know this will have to go through the legislation, I'm, I'm sure, but would you support that in having voting machines on campus a few weeks before voting, before they graduate, to allow them to participate in where we're registering them to vote? That's a big question. Um, the answer to your, the answer to the question, Katri, I would absolutely support early voting when it is funded. Until you fund it, I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but until you fund it, the county clerks can't afford to do any more than they're already doing. Um, we just can't. We're spending, we're, we are whittling every bit out of the bone. But until the Secretary of State's office, the legislators can find a way to fund us, we can't afford to do any more early voting. We don't have the funds, we don't have the ability, we don't have the people, we don't have, we just don't have it. So the answer to your question is theoretically, absolutely. I'm for early voting, but I'm not for it until we fund it. I'm, we put too many unfunded mandates out there and the county cannot afford it. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Can you give us an explanation? Last year, I think something changed where you could vote early if you just say you're old. Yes, ma'am. All right. <laughs> I tried it. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going yeah. out of town, but I thought, you know, so I just said, I'm old. And she said, okay. Yeah. So I said, do I have to tell you how old I am? No. Nope. No, I don't, I don't think the legislators were thinking when they quite wrote that law. Um, and I don't mean that, no disrespect, Joe, but um, when they wrote age, they didn't put an age. And my biggest theory in life is, answer, ask the person, why are you here? For age, if they're 22 years old, that's an age. She said, "If you say you're old, if you say yeah. you're old, you get to vote early, right?" Yeah. Age. We're not going to get into old because I think you're plenty young, Miss Strickland. <laughs> Thank you. So we can tell. You know, I canvass a lot, and for some folks, that does make a difference because they think they they can't get there. So if if I tell them they can go down there and say that they're, they don't say they're old. What do they say? Age. I'm age. That's I'm the way that, that's the way the law reads. Like bourbon, I'm aged. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Very very good question. Thank you very much. One more quick one. I don't think y'all need the mic. Uh, yeah, we we do for the for the teacher. You talked about the precincts and and how they're drawn, but who draw, who establishes that? What entity? The Franklin County Board of Elections. The Franklin County Board. But we have to wait until the census to get all of right. our blocks in. They'll give us census blocks, and I've never done this, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm excited or a little bit terrified of the whole event. Um, as you know, you know there are some lines that are that don't make sense in Franklin County. Um, when you have West Overdrive in the middle of one precinct and East Overdrive in the middle of another precinct, it's really hard to tell, especially when they're magisterial splits like that. Um, I would love to correct most of those issues, <laughs> but overall, we need 44 precincts because of the amount of people. We want to have around 800 to 1,000 people in those precincts. And did it, you said the state board uh, does is in control of voter rolls, the yeah. registrations. Yes, ma'am. And do you know if they do a purge on a regular schedule or anything? It just happens as it happens. Yes, ma'am. Okay, another Thanks. question over here. Uh, to get back to Katricia's question, is there a reason why the students could not vote absentee? 
the, if they were not able to be on campus? If they were not being a, on, in town on they election day they from, were eight, yes, from six to six, they are but absolutely, but they, I can't do it up here. That, that was a two part. There were so many questions going on with Patricia's question. They would have to come down to my office to vote if they, they were going to be out of town. Why couldn't they do an absentee? Ballot? They could do a melon absentee. And I think I run into some issues up with the university. And the reason I run into them, because I think some of the times the voter registration is not explained to them. And their children and kids that are from Jefferson and Fayette. And they, they're already registered, and they plan on voting, and people aren't explaining it well enough. They're planning on voting in Jefferson or Fayette or Fleming or wherever they're from. So when I come up here, that's why I want to do most of your voter drives on campus, is because I want to explain to them what their rights are. Okay. Very good questions. Uh, is, do we have more back here? Another question? All right. Mine's just a follow-up. So they can do absentee, but like you said, these students are, some of them are first-time voters, right. and they do not understand the process of going down, and some of them really don't even know where your office is. So as we're coming on campus to registering them, we do need to educate them in that process, definitely. And um, I've done a lot of registrations on campus and tried to explain definitely that you know you're here for four years you should vote where you're at and a lot of them do say I'm going back home to Louisville or Detroit to vote and then I make it realistic to them to say okay you know voting is on Tuesday in most areas right are you really going to jump in your car and drive an hour or three hours to go vote no so your best bet if you want to have something to say in where you live register in Kentucky where you can walk or literally drive down the street and vote rather than saying, oh, I can't make it to Indianapolis now, it's already two o'clock, I can't make that drive. So I really do push that because I feel like a lot of students really do care, but a lot of them don't vote on campus because they don't know where to vote, or it's really, really confusing in whether they go to Exum, the um, alumni house, and things of that nature. So is there a way that Kentucky State, uh, before election, can get, um, maybe the student life area or student engagement area get a list of all the students of where they where their precinct is so they can walk to that one office and know the day before rather than always going online to look up that information i'm not sure katricia if i can manipulate the website to give me that information just for the students um and you're right there is a problem i mean hickory and alumni now they're both in the same building I've, I've taken them from separation for that reason. Now they're both in the Exum Center, and I did that to avoid that confusion. So if they end up in one location, they're not here or the other side of campus. They're in one location. So I fixed part of it, um, but I don't know. I would have to look at, my, at the VRS system and see if I could use. It would be hard for me to manipulate the information, but I'll try. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, Jeff, you know, if you would, would you like to make some closing statements? No, ma'am. No, sir. Okay. All right. Let's give a hand for all of our people. I don't know if they're all here yet. Thank you very much for being here. Josh, thank you for your participation. We sure do appreciate that. I got one little thing left over to do, and it's kind of a fun little exercise. So if we'd all, we need to st stretch our legs anyway. So let's all just stand up. All right, so this is just on some percentages here. Okay, everybody in the, this on, the, on your left-hand side of the room, the four tables in the back, go ahead and sit down. Go ahead and sit down, the four tables in the back. All right? All right. Now, the four tables over here uh, in this side of the room, in the front, you all sit down. Okay, now we have how many people standing here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people standing. Okay, In a, excuse me. Uh, by the percentages, these are the people in our last governor's race that elected the governor. Okay, so that's the way, that's what happens. Are they the people that voted or didn't vote? These are the people that voted. Okay, these are the people who...
It's because it's, it was, I believe that the numbers were right. 75% of the people are, of the, of the state of Kentucky are registered to vote. Only 50% of the 75% actually voted. So that's what we have left standing here is 50% 50, 50 of the 75%. And so those are the people that picked the governor last election. I don't know, Josh, th this is really rough in, in my head when I was looking over the room. But at any rate, the deal is we've got to get people out to vote. Voting is essential. We have to get people engaged. Everybody here is saying we've got to get people engaged. So get out, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family. Let's get these people registered and let's vote and let's have wonderful elections. October 7th. October 7th, the last day to register. So let's get people out to register and get them knowledgeable in voting. Thank you. Thank you.